All right, first question. Is my microphone working? Yes, yes there are people waving in the back. Good, excellent. Uh, hello, everyone. This is ex incredibly exciting for me. This is my first time in Slovakia at all, so I'm super thrilled to be here, and I'm really excited by how many people showed up for a talk with such an uninspiring name. <laughs> it's all really good. Um, so, yes, my name is Corey Benfield. I'm a London-based software developer, and uh, taking a cue from uh, Bjarni, I uh, didn't do what Bjarni did. I made free software my job by getting employed at a megacorp, which I can highly recommend, uh, so long as the corp is big enough that you can hide and no one asks too many questions about what you're doing. <laughs> so my day job, I work for Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and I work in Hewlett Packard Enterprise's upstream team, a collection of about 12 people uh, who all do roughly what I do, which is hide and hope no one asks questions. Uh, <laughs> our job is to work on the projects that uh, Hewlett Packard relies on uh, from the open source and free software communities, making sure that they are maintained and forward-looking, they get new features, uh, and in particular, our remit is to be building things that Hewlett Packard doesn't know it needs yet, uh, which isn't that hard. Hewlett Packard is very big. Um, for me, this means Python HTTP. Uh, this is why I was hired in, and this is what I do. Uh, the number of projects I work on is uh, unreasonably grotesquely large, and I'm not going to list them. Uh, the core ones, the important ones, are the Python Hyper Project, which is a collection of tools for working with HTTP. It's a little toolbox of things that you can put together if you need to build something specific. Um, I work on requests and URL lib3. I've been a core maintainer on both of those for about three years now. Requests, I suspect most of you have heard of. Uh, can I get hands real quickly? Yeah, OK, most of you. Um, URL lib3, most of you probably haven't heard of. Uh, URL lib3 is the library that powers requests. So you all have it, you just don't know you do. Uh, and it's pretty great, too. Uh, I also get to claim that I'm part of the Python cryptographic authority, because I have the commit bit on PyOpenSSL, even though mostly what I just do is say, yes, Hinnick, this looks like good work. Um, so moving on, uh, the original title of this talk uh, I never actually submitted it with this, but the original title of this talk was going to be Why All Your Libraries Are Garbage and All But One of Mine Are Too. This title is a bit too combative for an actual conference schedule, but I wanted to put it up here to highlight something really important about this talk. I'm going to be talking about a systemic problem in the way we build open source Python network libraries, but I'm not criticizing or blaming anyone who has built such a library. This is not any of our faults. This is a cultural problem that exists in the community. It is bigger than any of us. If you pick up and build a library like this, you will almost certainly fall into the trap that I'm about to describe, and that's just nothing to do with you. I did it too, all the time. I've done this right exactly once, and I've been doing this a little while. All right, so I'm gonna talk about HTTP for a while, because this is all I think about. But I think we can agree that, generally speaking, working with HTTP and Python is pretty excellent. As languages go, Python's got one of the greatest HTTP ecosystems floating around. You can make some arguments for Go. You can make some incorrect arguments for Ruby. But generally speaking, Python is pretty good. And the reason it's good is because we've developed this really great collection of tools and libraries that exist in the third-party ecosystem. We've got the client-side tools, things like requests and that set of things. Um, people who don't know about it, HTTPI, HTTPIE, I've never known how Jacob likes that being pronounced, uh, is basically a curl replacement written in Python that does uh, highlighting of its output. So if you work with things that return JSON, it will automatically pretty print and highlight the JSON. It's extremely convenient. We've got great pure Python web servers like Green Unicorn. Um, and then we've got all these great asynchronous tools. We've got AIO HTTP, Twisted, Tornado. These have all got uh, clients and servers in them. They're all great tools. And these, plus the many, many tools I haven't mentioned, cover an enormous variety of use cases. They cover clients through to servers, through to proxies. We cover things that provide really convenient APIs to make it easy to do the right thing. We provide things that have all the switches in the world to make it easy to do the wrong thing. Uh, there's, there's lots of different options you've got. But every single one of these things suffers from the exact same problem. And that exact same problem is that they basically don't share any code at all. There is obviously a caveat here. They're written in Python, right? So they share the standard library. They all use the collections module, probably. 
but that's kind of trivial. What I mean is they don't share any HTTP code. Now, I suspect most of you haven't thought about this, but at first blush, it seems kind of odd. I mean, we generally, as a community, agree that code reuse is good. People at least claim code reuse is good, and if someone asked you on a test, you would say, yes, code reuse is good. Um, the reality of it is a little bit trickier than that, but generally speaking, code reuse is good when you have a problem that has a really well-defined scope and one right answer. If your problem has got multiple right answers, you might need to write multiple versions of the code to get the different answers out. If the problem has got an unclear scope, you might need multiple versions of the code to deal with the varied scopes. But when you've got a very clear scope with one right answer, you really do only need one good implementation of the code. Some examples of problems like this are network protocol parsing, turning an HTTP message from a stream of bytes into some representation of that message. There's only one right answer to that. And it's very, very limited in scope. It only happens in one place. Other similar problems, compression algorithms are exactly like this. Uh, and file formats, with the possible exception of PDF, are exactly like this as well. There is only one right answer to them. With PDF, there is no right answer. You cannot parse a PDF file. It can't be done. So given that HTTP message parsing, this strict, strictly defined problem, can only be solved one right way, why don't our libraries share any code for this? Why have all of our library authors gone away and written their own? Well, I'm going to tell you right now, it's not because they didn't like the ones that were already there. The reason they've done it is because every HTTP parser in the Python ecosystem, every single one of them, mixes its I.O. in with its parsing. Just quick examples from the set that I've used. HTTP lib, this is the parser that requests users under the covers. It's terrible. Um, it has its state machine and its parser mixed in with its I.O. What I mean by this is the bits of code that parse the HTTP message have got socket calls interspersed in and around them, and those socket calls affect the way the parsing works. The parser will increment some amount of time and then decide it needs more data and wait for it from a socket library. This is an extremely toxic anti-pattern because it makes it very, very hard to get the parser out in a way that allows you to reuse it somewhere else. If you don't want to use those socket calls, good luck trying to get the parser out. For those of you who care about network protocols, the state machine is the other important thing, and the state machine in HTTP lib is even worse because it is an implicit state machine. There is actually no code that is just state machine, uh, which makes it almost impossible to extract the state machine from HTTP lib. The only plus point to all of this is that you wouldn't want HTTP lib's parser and state machine even if you could get them. The various async modules have a similar problem. They're usually better about their I.O. because of the way they're structured. But they still usually commit a different sin, which is that they mix their async primitives in with their parser instead. So instead of making socket receive calls and to grab data, they instead wait for a deferred, for example. And that's fine, except if you're not in Twisted, you don't have a deferred. And so you can't wait for it anymore. So you need to rewrite all this code anyway in order to strip all that out and put in your thing of choice. Because you can't pull this parser out, you end up with this uh, Python feeling that I think we've all had, which is that once you've chosen how you want to do I.O. in your application, you rapidly find that what looked like this enormous collection of choices becomes quite a lot smaller. If you have decided that you like Tornado, but you also have decided that you would like to make your client calls with requests, well, good luck. You're either going to become very familiar with Tornado's thread pool, or you're going to just have to do something different. You don't really have an option. And so now I feel, settling over the room, the question of who cares? Why does this matter at all? So we've got a lot of HTTP parsers. The world is not going to end just because of this. Well, there are some real problems because of this. The first one is that we are wasting our time. And I feel like everyone in the room dislikes this notion of when they have to solve a problem that has already been solved again. And we're doing a lot of this. AIO HTTP, the async IO HTTP asynchronous E goodness thing, um, is a, the new kid on the block. It's only been around a couple years. 
And so they were coming into this space that had a lot of HTTP tools in them. Did they really need a new parser? Was the parser the thing they were trying to solve? Was their problem none of the parsers are any good? The answer to that is no. The problem was nothing used yield from, which they really wanted. And in fact, not only did they have to write their own parser here, they don't like their own parser. It's not very good. This is not their fault. It's hard to write a good parser. They didn't, it wasn't the focus of their time. They're looking to replace it. But of course, they're looking to replace it. There's still nothing else they can use. The request team use HTTP lib. I've just been very mean about HTTP lib for the last five minutes. And if you'd like to come and talk about how bad HTTP lib is, I'm happy to tell you. I've said that request uses HTTP lib. It's not even really true. We've monkey patched about a half of it. Uh, and at this point, it looks nothing like the actual HTTP lib. Uh, and we'd much rather not be using it. But there's nothing else we can use. And this happens every time someone builds a new HTTP library in Python. Every single time. They have to write a new parser or they have to conform very tightly to the one that's already there. They have to, and, th and this is a follow-on problem, because it reduces experimentation in this space. I don't think, look, hand in the air, as a requests developer, I don't think requests is the end-all, be-all of API design. I think there is room for alternative API design approaches to HTTP, but they're hard to do, because if they are gonna diverge very substantially from what's already there, uh, it, it becomes difficult, if not impossible, to actually make the code work, or you have to write your own parser, which is not what you wanted to do. You just wanted to play with this new API design idea. This gets even worse if you're the kind of person who cares about doing I.O. If you wanted to play with lots of different I.O. ideas, then you are absolutely out of luck. You just definitely will have to write your own parser. There's just no option for you. And this is totally unnecessary overhead. There's only one right answer here. Why are you solving this problem again? when you didn't need to. There should be no requirement on you to solve this problem. But probably the worst is that this causes us to duplicate our bugs. HTTP looks very simple to parse. How many people in here have written HTTP parsers? Hoping I'll get at least one hand. I've got two hands, that will do. Both of your parsers are wrong. And I don't mean this in like a mean way, it's just Parsing HTTP right is really hard. My parsers aren't right either. I should put my hand in the air. The only parser I've ever used that was right was not written by me. Uh, it is almost impossible to do correctly. The protocol is very, very ill-defined, very hazy, and then you have the problem of uh, whether you're pro uh, parsing the protocol as written or in the spec or the protocol as used on the web, which is not the same thing. And so we, we make bugs. This is just what happens. Bugs enter these libraries, and then, they enter the same pars the, the parsing library in a different library altogether. Chunks transfer encoding. There are bugs all over the place, and we keep bumping into the same ones in different libraries and fixing them again, which compounds our wasted effort. And then one more, which is one I think people often don't think about. It limits your ability to optimize your I.O. Most people don't think about this, especially in Python land, because we write in Python a language where optimizing our CPU time is frequently more important than optimizing our I.O. But optimizing I.O. is a real thing that you can really do, and it's hard. It's really, really hard. And that causes a problem if you can't get at the I.O. and pull out the bad solution that's already there and put in one that's tailored to your problem. If your I.O. is very tightly tied to your parser, then your parser is informing your I.O. strategy, which it should not be doing and it's limiting your freedom to change the way you approach I.O. So hopefully I've convinced you that this does cause real problems. None of them are earth-shattering problems. None of them are preventing us getting our work done, which is why, generally speaking, this does not get talked about. This is not a problem like bad TLS configuration. This is not a problem like the API literally does not allow me to achieve my job. It's a problem that says you're wasting some time you're wasting some money. We could be doing better here. And we can be doing better here. This is a problem you can avoid. And avoiding it is just really, really easy. Don't do I.O. in your parser. Just don't do it. If you're writing a parser for a network protocol, for a file format, anything like that, just have a rule. No I.O. Don't import the I.O. library. Don't import the socket library. Don't use the word keyword open. Don't use any function called read. Don't use a function called write. 
Uh, there's probably some good other ones too. Don't use a function called print. That's a good one. Don't print things. It's tempting to print things. Don't print things. Don't do I.O. at all. You should be possible for you to build a 100-foot high wall between the bit of your program that does I.O. and the bit of your program that parses a file format or a network protocol. They should know nothing about each other. And if they do know nothing about each other, then you can pick that parser up and use it somewhere else. If you decide to rewrite a whole swathe of your application, you don't need to rewrite the parser because you got the parser right the first time. There's only one right answer here, and you hopefully have tests, and so you know it's right. If you get this wrong, even just a little bit, it dramatically increases the amount of work you have to do to reuse the work you have already done. And to be really helpful, I'm going to give you an example of how this should look. This is a much better API for building network protocol parsers. You get one function that looks like the thing on the top. This function takes in data. It doesn't care where the data come from, came from. It doesn't care how the data is broken up, unless that is meaningful in your protocol or file format, which it can be, but usually isn't. It just gets some data. And then it returns what I'm calling events. This is a slightly tricky thing. We don't actually have good terminology for what this is supposed to be. I like to call them events uh, in C-land, where they have not made this mistake. Uh, frequently, this actually involves invoking callbacks. Um, but what happens is the function tells you, given the bytes I just received, here are all the things that happened on the network protocol. In HTTP, this would be things like, I received a request, or I received some data, or the connection went away, or I received some chunk transfer encoding trailers, which is a feature no one supports. This kind of thing, this abstract representation, for file formats, you would probably want to go a little bit differently. Depending on the format, you might actually need to be incrementally building up a tree. This is a slightly trickier thing to do, and I'm not going to talk about it too much more, but the general idea is still sound. You say, you gave me some data. It had these things. This data might have had the beginning of more things, but they're incomplete, and that's fine. There should be some buffering internally. Once the caller has given the bytes to the function, that should be the end of those bytes. They should be able to forget that they ever existed. Then symmetrically on the other side, you have a series of functions that look like the bottom. For each event that can happen, it should be possible for the user to trigger that event. And they should do that by calling a function and passing any of the associated metadata they need. HTTP, you can receive a request. Well, you should be able to send a response. So you have a function called send response. What do responses have? Status codes, reason phrases, headers. It takes all of those things too. And then it returns some bytes, just some bytes. Once that's happened, the protocol parser has washed its hands of the situation. It is done. That's its job. Over. Here are your bytes. The key here is the protocol parser doesn't care where the bytes come from, and it doesn't care where they go. This is great. This lets you swap out your I.O. implementation altogether. Do you want to write HTTP to a file? Fine. Go nuts. You just change where you're writing your output bytes. Everything gets pretty easy. The goal is you just don't care where the bytes come from or where they go. This does not solve all problems. I should be clear. Particularly with network protocols, there are often things that cannot be done automatically. They require user input in some way. HTTP2 is problematic for this. It has this notion of flow control, which allows you to control how much data the sender is allowed to send you at any one time. Obviously, the parser should not be making flow control decisions. The parser is not in charge. In this kind of situation, your parser should make it possible to, for the user to make those decisions, and should probably have in its documentation, which all your internal code should be having, uh, it, should make it, it should have a little thing in the documentation that says, here's how you do it. These are the events you will get. Here are the responses you should be making. Once you've done this, once you've got your little protocol parser, the real thing you do is you write, build wrappers for it. You wrap it in a higher level library that does know how to do I.O. I want to stress here that I'm not saying that requests shouldn't exist or that Twisted shouldn't exist or any of the high-level libraries shouldn't exist. Of course they should exist. They're great. I don't expect you as a web developer on a deadline to start writing, to pick up my protocol parser and start writing an HTTP implementation from the ground up. That's crazy. But what I do expect is that when you pick up requests, requests should not look like it looks now. It should not be a stack of libraries all the way down to the bottom to the socket calls. Instead, requests should have a protocol parser somewhere over here 
and an I.O. layer somewhere over here, and it should mediate them together. Requests should be API and I.O. Ideally, it shouldn't even be I.O., but that's a different talk. It should be API and I.O. The protocol parser should be exactly the same as the one AIO HTTP has. AIO HTTP should be using exactly the same parser with a different API and a different I.O. layer. That would ideally mean in a world where you had uh, lots of things installed in a virtual environment, if you update your parser, everything gets bug fixes all at once, like magic. Someone in the Linux community told me that shared libraries are a thing that used to be a good idea. Perhaps maybe there, are some value, there is some value here. What you want is to have one parser with two very different feeling libraries. There are some advantages to developing this way for the parser as well. And the big headline one is that testing it is so much easier. Who here writes tests for their code? Not every hand has gone up, which makes me a little bit nervous. Um, <laughs> how many of you who didn't put your hand up make a product that you sell? Cool, I've got one hand, two. OK, I've got a couple of very nervous hands. That's good. I just want to know whose products I shouldn't be buying. Um, testing's important. I think even those of who didn't put their hands up can agree that testing is important and a thing you should do, even if it's not always a thing you do do. Testing libraries, testing anything that does I.O., is hell. It is the worst thing to do in the world because your I.O. logic is inexorably mixed in with the logic that makes other kinds of decisions. You can't test HTTP libs parser without also testing its I.O. because they're the same thing. And so you need to send all the data in through wacky socket messages, and now you're mocking out sockets. And then all of a sudden, you have to start testing every possible timing issue that could ever happen on a network protocol layer to make sure that HTTP lib does the right things in the right places. And that's crazy. It is an impossible thing to do. With the new model, where the parser is just function calls, testing it's stupidly easy. We all know how to test function calls. And you get to start doing some of the really clever things. So this up here is a library I work on, the only library I've ever done this right with. Um, those are the tests from a couple months ago. It had about 500 something. What that's not showing you is that about 20 of those tests are property-based tests using the hypothesis testing library. That means that it tests the same function does something sensible with hundreds of different kinds of input. So actually, there are more like 1,000 tests here where 20 or 30 of them are uh, written in such a way that they run 100 instances of themselves very quickly. Additionally, you might want to note, the tests are all together pretty fast, and they don't spuriously break from time to time. There are no timing issues here that can cause your tests to mysteriously fail. If the tests fail, something has actually gone wrong. And then, ideally, it allows you to make some really nice assertions about what kind of code is reachable. Because data can only get into the parser in one place and only out of the parser in a specific set of places, it's very, very easy to work out whether or not your code can be reached. If there is no possible input of bytes that can reach a line of code, then that line of code is superfluous because no set of input of bytes can ever get there. This makes it very, very easy to write a library that is relatively concise and fairly easy to test. This is all really good. The other little one that I think people forget is, again, the way you do I.O. matters very much. How many people in here have written anything that calls into the socket library? I'm not expecting many hands. Ah, oh, quite a few of you. All right, how many of you can recite for me now every socket flag defined on Linux and what it does? No hands for the stream. This is good. This is because, of course, you don't know that. Why would you know that? This is a ridiculous thing to know. But there are people whose job it is to know that. They are the people whose job it is to take an high, already high-performing application and squeeze an extra 20 requests a second out of it. And they do that by caring very, very deeply about the I.O. on their platform of choice. It is hard to write a high-performing I.O. stack. It is hard to write a good parser. Expecting someone to have both of those skills at the same time is Ludicrous. If you find such a person, hire them immediately and never let them leave. They are, there will never be more than a couple of those in a generation, and I'm definitely not that good. If you don't have to solve a problem, don't solve it. If you don't have to solve your I.O. problem, if you don't care about how fast your I.O. is, don't make those I.O. decisions for other people who might care. So it is just solve one problem at a time, and then Build a toolbox of really great implementations. I dream of a Python world where we had one really good protocol parser. 
it would be fast, it would be correct, it, the code would be relatively clean. And the reason that would be the case is because all 200 people who work on open source Python HTTP would be contributing fixes to the same library because it matters to all of us. But that's not the world we have. Instead, the world we have is where the async IO people contribute fixes to async IO, but never to requests because they don't care. And that's unfortunate. More manpower would be good. We need to make it possible for us to work together in a more effective way than the way we do it now. And having these silos doesn't help. It then frees up the 80 odd developers on each project who don't care about the protocol parsing at all. They care about IO or they care about API design. They shouldn't have to think about parsers. We should be freeing them up to do what they're good at and letting the people who care about parsers, the weirdos like me, care about parsers. For those of you who feel like this talk was a little bit theoretical, uh, this is the only library I've ever written where I do this right. Uh, this is a pure Python HTTP2 protocol stack. HTTP2 is quite complicated. Uh, you can go look at the docs and get a feel, particularly the API docs, and get a feel for the way this works. Um, then I'm going to segue and say, if you are interested in this and you think it's an idea that you want to investigate a bit more, then you should come along and try and help. I am one person and I can only do so much. So if you can think of a problem that would benefit from being solved in this way, write something that fits that little API design. It was only one slide. It's pretty easy. Um, write something that fits that kind of design and see how it feels. See if it feels natural to use it. If you instead want to see HTTP2 in your Python library of choice, pick up HyperH2 and plug it in. I'm going to be around for the next uh, day or so, so I'll be happy to give you some guidance if you need it. But also, I answer emails. Feel free to get in touch. I have a Twitter account. Uh, I'm always happy to help out. And it should be relatively straightforward. Uh, I just used all the words for that slide. And I am done. So I am now happy to take questions. OK. Uh, your thoughts on wide adoption of HTTP version 2? Uh, <laughs> I feel like some more detail in this question would be good, but I'll just answer it in general. Uh, I think we're already there, actually. Uh, HTTP 2 is already much, much more broadly adopted than uh, IPv6, which is a win. Um, but in particular, once Cloudflare switched over, I think the statistics are now that roughly one quarter of web traffic is HTTP 2 already. So you're all using it. You just didn't know it yet. Uh, if anyone's got a relatively modern browser, you're using it. OK, uh, next one. Does uh, HTTP 2 spec solve the issues you talk about? Uh, the issues about being hard to parse, I assume, is where that question came from. Uh, yes, HTTP 2 is much easier to parse. It is a more complicated protocol from a state machine perspective, but parsing it is trivial, and it's quite easy to write a fairly quick Python parser of it, which is another massive win. OK, so the next que question, actually, it contains a suggestion. Speaking of protocols, can HP dedicate some resources to developing Python's IPFS implementation? Uh, I feel like that's a question that should come to me after the talk, because I can't make promises for HP on camera. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, the next one. How would you approach writing a library for a loosely specced joke of a <laughs> protocol like Bluetooth? Generously. Um, the answer is it'll take a long time. Uh, the goal should be the, uh, so the overall design goal should be the same. You get bytes. With something like Bluetooth, which is a little bit lower level, uh, that some other problems do start coming into play, and it is much harder to divorce the parsing of such a protocol uh, from I.O. You can usually divorce the parsing. Divorcing the state machine is almost impossible. Uh, the best advice I can give is to get the largest corpus of sample traffic you can find and keep testing with it. You need as many possible variations of that input as you can possibly find to use for your test suite and run it all, all the time, constantly. That is the only way you have any chance of succeeding for a protocol as loosely spec'd as that. The same advice applies to HTTP 1.1, by the way. OK, next one. Separate <clears throat> separating parsing and I.O. concerns in request twisted whatever library seems like a natural thing to do. Do you know why devils are not doing it already? Uh, I've got some theories. 
my theory for things like requests for the kind of synchronous code flow in Python is that Python made doing socket IO quite a lot easier than it was in C. And as a result, it is now sufficiently easy that most developers are inclined to just do it. If you're working either investigatively or to a deadline, you're much less likely to be concerned about uh, your code structure and much more likely to be concerned about how quickly can I get something that appears to do the job. And putting your socket calls in line is a very, very fast way to get to that. That's how I suspect we got there in the synchronous world. In the async world, as I suggested, I think the bigger problem usually actually is they just know a great deal about the way async is done in that particular world. Twisted's HTTP code uh, would not work in async IO without substantial changes. Uh, that's not entirely Twisted's fault. Twisted is 12 years older than async IO is, but the point still stands. Uh, the way it was developed was for Twisted with no particular goal of code reuse, so it just wasn't a priority. Okay, uh, next one. Uh, what do you think about including popular Python libraries, example requests, into standard library? Oh, that's easy. The request team has a policy on this. Um, the standard library is where modules go to die. By which I mean, <laughs> the standard library uh, limits the ability of a module to change, and particularly to change rapidly, and to support that change for people who, for whatever reason, cannot update their Python. If you are stuck on Python 2.7, having requests in the standard library would have been pretty terrible for you. Your security would have been really pretty bad for a long time. Anything that touches security critical code, like requests does with its TLS, just should not be stuck on Python's release cycles. It took so much effort to backport a good SSL module to Python 2.7, the idea of having to do that for requests every time we needed to make a change is heartbreaking. I, I couldn't possibly bear it. So for things like that, I think staying outside the standard library is the way to go. Uh, the agreement we reached with the Python dev team uh, is one you can go and see. If you go look at the documentation for unit test two, uh, you will notice that the document, uh, not unit test two, uh, URL lib2, you will notice that the documentation says right at the top, don't use this module, use requests. Uh, we feel like that's probably the right uh, middle ground there. Okay, uh, and the last question, which HTTP library could be used as a basis for this abstract parser isolated from I.O.? Would it be possible to isolate and merge parsers from different libraries? That is a great question. I'm sad that it came at the bottom because only one other person in this room is as nerdy as me. Uh, on this issue, plenty of you are still super nerdy. Um, I think the answer is uh, there barely is one. The closest there is is there are two wrappers for a C library called uh, Pico HTTP parser, which is used at the basis of the web server H2O. Uh, that library is stupid crazy fast. Uh, which is why there are two wrappers for it, and it is just a parser. It is probably the only just an HTTP parser you can find on PyPI. Uh, so if I was going to start, I would say that that should be the basis, and then we should retrofit a Python-only implementation on top of it. I am currently not volunteering for that work. I have been asked to look at it in the past. I still reserve the right to look at it, because I'm not, I do what I want. <laughs> um, but right now, it's not. I, I don't think, basically, I don't think the uh, trade-off for it is worth it. I think the amount of work required to write it is less than the value we would derive from it, because it would be very, very hard to move all the things that already have working solutions to this new model. In other words, HTTP 1 is dead. Long live HTTP 2. OK, uh, so I think that was the last question. So thank you for your talk. Thank you.